Hey there, marketing analytics students. In this brief video, we're going to cover a basic application of the Gabor Granger method in Excel. I highly recommend that you download the spreadsheet that I use in this video and play along with and observe all the unique characteristics of how the spreadsheet was designed. Uh, some of the prerequisites that I don't cover in depth in the video, but you may need to go back and do a little Googling or reviewing on your own to understand, is we do use a VLOOKUP function. We do talk about something called the Logit model. We also talk about how to calibrate the parameters for that Logit model using Microsoft Solver. So if you're not familiar with these things, you probably want to go check those out yourself or investigate the spreadsheet a little more closely. With the prerequisites out of the way, let's dive into the video. On this spreadsheet, we have all the pieces that come together to predict the relationship between the price that we might sell a product and the probability or percentage of people who we estimate will purchase it. In this scenario, we are selling a backup data plan for small businesses. We collected survey data from 10 representative customers where each one participated in a pricing experiment where we priced the product at 50, 60, 70, and $80. They responded on a one to five point scale to each one of the questions of what intentions they would have to buy the product at that particular price point, ranging from definitely will not buy to five definitely will buy. We applied the following probabilistic translations based on managerial expertise, where a definitely will buy actually only translates to a 50% chance of real purchase. We then translate the scores that we saw from our uh, survey into those purchase probabilities. We did that in this Excel spreadsheet using a simple V lookup here. We then take the averages of these 10 customers. So to the extent that these customers are perfectly representative of our total market, when we sell the product at $50 under the assumption that definitely will buy is 50% and all the other assumptions we've made, we think that 34% of the market will purchase our product. On the other hand, if we sell our product at $80 based on our assumptions, we assume that only 2% of the market will buy. Our real goal here though, is to take these pricing points and we'd like to actually estimate the percent of the customers who will make a purchase at points in between, such as $52, $56, or $66. We do that by calibrating a Logit model. We see that here, and our equation takes that same Logit form that we've been used to seeing all semester. There's only one small wrinkle here. Normally, when we're estimating probabilities of purchase, we assume that the purchase probability varies between 0 and 100%, or 1. So the numerator in the Logit model is a 1, being the 100% chance of buying. But in this case, we're aggregating people together, and we're assuming there's some sort of cap or threshold uh, maximum of people that will actually purchase, or customers that might purchase. And the most common assumption that we make here is we simply look at our most optimistic scenario. In our case, at $50, we have an estimate that 34% of people will buy. And that explains why you see up here, where we normally would just have a one in the numerator of the Logit model, we have a max function. It just simply looks across the observed dollars and says, okay, the absolute highest percent that we'll ever estimate uh, a customer will buy at any given price point is the max that's observed. So in our case, it'll be 34. In the other components that we're used to seeing in the Logit model, we of course have a down here in our uh, denominator, we have the so-called beta zero or the sort of the intercept. And we have our slope for uh, D2, which D2 represents in this case, the price, but any price point. And these are the estimated beta parameters that we calibrate it, which then creates this nice logit curve that we see here that fits the data points that we actually observed. These red dots represent the average values we observe here uh, rather closely. We can tell that it fits rather closely also here because we have the sum of the squared error. We simply calculate the sum of squared error here using the sum XMY2 function in Excel, where we have our average values, the observed values, and our estimated values from our calibrated logit model. The difference between the two of those squared gives us the sum of our squared error. It's a nifty little function that helps us out. And of course, you can tell by how nice this curve fits the data points. This probably is a correctly calibrated model already. And we have very little error. But then the question becomes, well, where did these particular parameter values come from, right? Like we didn't know going in that that's what they should be calibrated as. In fact, if we just started somewhere, we might have just, again, arbitrarily guessed, I don't know, maybe 14 and negative 0.3. And 
you can just look at the curve with your eyeballs and say, oh, okay, that, that's not a well-fitting line. What do we do? And as we have in many other cases where we want to objectively calibrate something, we can use solver. Our objective here is we want to minimize the summation of our squared error, right? The, the smallest amount of error possible. And which variable cells can we change? Well, we want to change these parameters. Hopefully solver will search about these parameter values to try to minimize our squared error, which of course should make a curve that fits the data points much better. Solver very quickly converges on a solution. And there we go. Just as we've done previously, we can see that that sets up our model quite nicely. So a couple major assumptions that are baked, baked into the Gabor Granger method. First, we are assuming that the way that we generated the actual purchase intention data is a high quality method. Of course, that's true for any research. For example, if it turns out that definitely will buy actually means there's a 75% chance, probably will buy means there's a 65% chance, and might buy is a 5% chance, and probably will not buy is also a 5% chance, well, we'd have to calibrate an entirely different model. So the question becomes, where do these numbers come from and how can we trust them? We'll talk about that next.